Thank you, Debbie. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning here at Woodcrest or online, wherever you may be. Uh, if you didn't come because of the snow, I don't blame you. Uh, who knows what we're going to have today. I mean, it is March after all, right? We've already had our 70 degree weather. Now it's time to get cold. Uh, if you stand with me, please, in your red songbook, song number 46. Song number 46, we'll sing all four verses of Crown Him With Many Crowns. <laughs> front of your bulletin is our verse for the month of March. Let us say it with the reference before and after, please. All together, 1 First Peter 2.21. 2, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2.21. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours to be in your house this morning. We thank you for our faithful members, <coughs> returning guests, perhaps some here for the first time. We just thank you for each one. We pray, Lord, that uh, your blessing will be upon the service here this morning, that as the word of God is pre preached and as we sing these songs, that our hearts will truly uh, reach towards heaven to get a glimpse uh, of the truth of, of what you have given to us and a glimpse of our Savior. Thank you for this Palm Sunday, uh, celebrated around the world by churches and, and religious organizations uh, to uh, commemorate the day when Jesus uh, came into the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and Lord, as we'll see uh, later, um, it wasn't to be crowned king, it was to be crowned with thorns. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to uh, reflect on some things that we can learn uh, from this great triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Lord, we know there are some that would love to be here this morning and are unable to be. We do pray for Kelly as she uh, recovers from the uh, knee replacement, uh, excuse me, hip replacement uh, as a result of a fall last week. And you'll give strength to her. And uh, Lord, we thank you that Pam could be here after her uh, surgery. And we pray for continued healing for her. Bless Brother Tim. And uh, Lord, the physical needs he has. Lord, there's many others, uh, the furries and, and uh Brother Rod, uh, Lord, uh, just guide and direct in, in Betty's life. And, and Lord, we just pray for uh, our elderly folks who would love to be here if they could be. 
uh, but are unable to be, or Brother Jerry as well. Lord, again, we just thank you for the privilege we do have to be here. And Lord, uh, with this snow event taking place, uh, pray that you'll just keep us safe on the roads and as we travel back and forth from different places, that you'll just watch over us and uh, guide us and direct us in these days uh, as this snow uh, determines to come. And thank you, Lord, that the Bible has said that you send the snow upon the earth. And we need the moisture, and so we thank you for it. Now, Lord, I pray your blessing upon all that takes place here this morning and in the uh, 318 Club and other parts of the building for our children and thank you for our buses that have picked up kids today. And, uh, Lord, I pray just uh, watch over this uh, service this day to your honor and glory, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Several years ago, uh, the Jewish flavor of Debbie Isaacs came out, and she put some words uh, to music, a very Jewish flavor. Uh, and it's a story about the tr uh, uh, triumphal entry. And I uh, hope that uh, you'll enjoy the choir as they sing Hosanna. <laughs> again please song number 33 song number 33 we'll sing all three verses of he is king
Let's ask God's blessing now upon the offering. Father, thank you that you are the King, you are the Lord, and uh, you are God of all gods. And we worship you this morning, and we thank you for the privilege we have to do so with our voices, and now with our monies, we thank you for the privilege we have to give for each and every one that uh, so faithfully and generously, sacrificially gives to the work here. We ask your blessing upon uh, this offering, and bless each uh, giver as they're able to give and meet their needs as well, in Jesus' name, amen. and Emma Friedel, who knew, as they were in band at Crown College in Tennessee, that one day they'd be playing in church as a married couple. And uh, thank you for that and appreciate their willingness to play this morning and, and many other opportunities to serve. In your Bible for our scripture reading, please, this morning, Mark chapter 11. The Gospel of Mark and chapter 11. If we follow the chronological events, the end of chapter 10, Jesus has healed a man near Jericho. And uh, they make their way to Bethany, 
and Beth Page. Uh, it's kind of on the Mount of the Olives on this side, and Jerusalem is over here in the middle of the Kidron Valley. And uh, triumphal entry takes place. Would you stand with me, please? I'd like to read beginning at verse 1. Mark 11, verse 1, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples, and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him. And straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, What do ye loosing the colt? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way, and many others and others cut down branches of the, off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. The triumphal entry, the subject of our message this morning, Josh will be a blessing to you. Ryan, you come and let's sing another congregational number, please. The song book scan, please. Song number 237. Song number 237 at the cross. <clears throat>
Now, I'm not going to say this lightly, but sometimes I wish I were charismatic. <laughs> they seem to have all the fun. Now, again, I'm not going to go there. I know it's not biblically correct, but sometimes I think they just understand what it means to be a born-again child of God on their way to heaven and not facing one second in hell Amen. if they're truly saved. And we Baptists are kind of stuck in the cold snow of winter 24-7, 365 days a year. And I think it's okay to get excited about the things of God, to get excited about the fact that it is finished, not at the cross, on the cross. I kept listening to that, and I thought, wait a minute. I've always heard at the cross, at the cross, which is true, but it was finished on the cross. What a wonderful thought. That was, that was a blessing. Thank you, ladies. That stirred my heart, and uh, well done. Appreciate all the time you spent in practicing. And we're going to spend a lot of, we're going to spend an hour on, on, on Wednesday uh, reading Scripture and singing songs about the cross. Uh, it's the Wednesday, of course, before Easter. It's our normal Wednesday night service. So I hope that you'll be here and fill this place up just like it is now. And uh, we'll have a wonderful time reflecting on the cross. In your Bible, please, this morning, once again, to Mark chapter 11. To much of the religious world today, this Sunday before Easter is called Palm Sunday. We know it is the triumphal entry, but it's also called Palm Sunday because of the branches of palm trees that people placed in the road as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In fact, John chapter 12, verse 13, in his account, records that people were taking the branches of palm, palm trees. Matthew and Mark mention branches of trees, while Luke mentions none of that. So who's right? Yes, all four of them are correct. From a different perspective, each one captured the excitement and jubilation of that day. And, and palm branches in that day were used uh, in marches and processions as emblems of rejoicing and, and victory parades, victory processions, and so on. And certainly the people had a cause for rejoicing in that day. They've seen the miracles performed. They, they've heard Jesus speak. They were convinced that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. In, in the book of John, we find in chapter 11 that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And in chapter 12 is the recording of the triumphal entry. And the Bible says that many of the people in Jerusalem that day remembered the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And so here comes Jesus, the, the man who has power over death. And so they assumed that he was indeed the promised Messiah entering Jerusalem to be crowned king and he would deliver the people finally from Roman rule and oppression. But of course we know that just a few days later, these people, many of them, were shouting crucify him. From receiving him on Palm Sunday to rejecting him just a few days later, from hail him to crucify him. But this morning, I'd like to take a few minutes to see why this event is so important that it's recorded in all four Gospels. And I think there's an interesting participant in this triumphal entry that we can learn some lessons from. And so, two thoughts this morning, a couple of sub-points, each or one. But number one, the importance of the event, and two, the interesting participant. So let's look at the importance of this event. Number one, we find the picture it represents. Secondly, we'll look at the purpose for the event. And then thirdly, we'll see the prophecy that it fulfills. So what is this picture that the triumphal entry shares with us today? Well, remember, Jesus was not coming into the city to be crowned king. At the beginning of his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the people of that day, the crowd understood this to be an external kingdom. But Christ was not speaking of an external kingdom. He was talking about an internal kingdom in the hearts of those who would repent. Jesus was indeed teaching and did teach that there were two kingdoms. There was a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual kingdom that was immediate and it was individual. And then there was a physical kingdom that was going to be accomplished at his second coming. 
That second coming, that second kingdom, we might say, concerns Israel as a nation. And of course, it includes all those who have repented and accepted Jesus' spiritual kingship into their hearts. And so when he entered Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, he entered knowing that he was about to deliver himself to die by the hands of his enemies. Now, it's likely that Jesus entered the city through the eastern gate, or as it has often been called, the golden gate. That's, that's, the, that's nearest to the temple. And so when Jesus entered the city, the Bible says, as we read in verse 11, he went into the, the temple. And so, as we read, uh, he came from the Mount of Olives. Uh, I think I said over here earlier. All right. Bethany and Bethpage uh, on the top of the Mount of Olives here. And again, when we say Mount, we're not talking a, a long, it's just a hill, big hill. Okay. And, and Jerusalem, of course, is on a hill. And in between, there's this Kidron Valley. And so they, they came from Bethany and down. And, and as, they wa- as they came into the eastern side of the city where the eastern gate was, that's where the crowds met them. And they crossed into the city with thousands cheering and praising their king. Now this event pictures another event. Another event when Christ will again return to establish his kingdom, and I believe he will enter through the eastern gate. Now today that gate is closed. But it will be reopened when Christ returns. Turn with me for a moment to the book of Ezekiel, the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, the prophecy. Beginning at chapter 40 and through the end of the book, Ezekiel is given a tour of the millennial temple. In chapter 43, we find Ezekiel giving this vision of God's glory Entering the millennial temple from the east through the eastern gate. Isaiah, or excuse me, Ezekiel 43, 1. Afterward, he brought me to the gates, even the gate that looked toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. And his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Verse 4. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me uh, out of the house, and the man stood by me, and he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredoms, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Uh, The king is coming in to Jerusalem to rule and to reign. And he's coming, I believe, through that gate of the east, as Ezekiel explains to us here. However, notice chapter 44. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of the gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. And so we find that the gate is shut, as it currently is. I believe prophesied here by Ezekiel. And and eventually that gate is going to be open when Jesus comes again. Now, why is it shut and and, and who closed it? All those questions are certainly valid. Well, many have tried to establish a, a reason. The one that is most believable and makes the most sense really to me. In 1517, nearly 500 years ago, the Ottoman Turks conquered Jerusalem Eventually, the leader of the Ottoman Turks was a man by the name of Suleiman the Magnificent. That's what my wife calls me every once in a while. Um, <laughs> Suleiman the Magnificent, all right? Uh, and, and he commanded uh, that the, the, the ancient walls be rebuilt, about 1535. And, and in the midst of the rebuilding project, he ordered in 1541 the eastern gate to be walled up with stones. Now, why? Well, again, that part is history, but the purpose was possibly 
that while the walls were being rebuilt, a rumor swept Jerusalem that the Messiah was coming. And by the way, there had been rumors of the coming Messiah for centuries in different places and times and peoples. And so there it was in the mid-1500s, the Messiah was coming. Suleiman, the Ottoman Turk, the leader, called together some Jewish rabbis and asked them to tell him about this Messiah. They described the Messiah as a great military leader who would be sent by God from the east. He would enter the city through the eastern gate and he would liberate the city from foreign control. Well, Suleiman was going to have nothing of that. And so he decided to end the Jewish hopes by ordering the eastern gate sealed. And then, on top of that, in front of the eastern gate, he put a Muslim cemetery in front of the gate, believing that no Jewish man would defile himself by walking through a Muslim cemetery. He was going to make sure the Messiah didn't come through that gate as long as he could help it. Now, by the way, if you've ever been to Israel, you can see this gate as it's walled up. When my wife and I had the privilege of going because of the good people of Woodcrest many years ago, uh, sent us uh, uh, on a round trip uh, <laughs> trip to, to Israel. And, and our leader, our guide, showed us, and, and we actually walked up to the, the eastern gate and were able to touch it. And yes, we had to walk through the cemetery that is still in existence today, an ancient cemetery with stones and headstones and so on there. And we kind of walked around carefully because we didn't want to disturb anybody in case anybody would, what are you doing? And well, we're just going to go touch the eastern gate, which we did. It's amazing. And there are pictures today. You can, you can go online and see the eastern gate all sealed up. <laughs> isn't, isn't mankind funny to think they can keep the Messiah out by, by putting up a few stones in a, in a gate? Those, those mean nothing to the Messiah. You see, when Jesus came the first time, as our scripture read in Mark chapter 11 and in all the other gospels, he rode a, a donkey from the Mount of Olives down the Kidron Valley and up the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate, where he entered the city. He entered the Temple Mount for his last days of earthly ministry. As he made that ride, thousands of admirers who had heard about the resurrection of Lazarus, as we said earlier, many thousands who had come to Jerusalem for the feast days, they waved their palm branches. They cried, Hosanna to the son of David. Notice the words there in verse 9. Hosanna. That's the word that simply means save, we pray. Eventually, it became an exclamation of praise. Save, we pray, from our Roman oppressors. Well, else did they say? Notice, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. A clear recognition that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. And then they go on, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of our Lord. Again, uh, they und undoubtedly thought that this kingdom that Jesus was going to set up was uh, Christ sitting on the throne of David. Again, prophesied hundreds of years ago. And then they finally end with Hosanna in the highest, a call to praise the Lord in the highest heavens, or perhaps even uh, for him to save from the highest heavens. Now, these weren't orchestrated comments. These were just comments that all the people were making at various times. And it was a loud, here's the word, cacophony. You say, what in the world is that? Look it up. It's a great word. There was just people shouting and screaming all these things about Jesus and Hosanna, the highest, our king has come, and all that they were saying. And, and, and they assumed that Jesus was coming to liberate them. Now, we've said that this is a picture. A picture of what? The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 19 that when Jesus returns, he will come in great power, not on a donkey. He's coming on a white horse. And Zechariah 14 tells us that he will touch the ground on the Mount of Olives, which is where Jesus began this triumphal entry. Revelation 19 also tells us that his redeemed are coming with him. Thousands, yea, perhaps even millions are going to come with him. We read in the book of Zechariah that the Lord will go forth and fight against the nations. He will be victorious. And then there will be a, a replay of this triumphal entry. The sealed eastern gate will be opened. And our Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, will enter the city with millions following through the Kidron Valley. And what are they shouting? Hosanna. Our Savior has come. 
And he will indeed at that time set up his kingdom. He will be crowned king of kings, Lord of lords, and God of gods, even as we sang this morning. Palm Sunday was a deliberate demonstration to picture what Jesus was capable of doing in the long run when those who receive him as Lord and Savior would come back with him to be part of that triumphal entry as he sets up his kingdom from the throne of David in Jerusalem. Well, what's the purpose? Secondly, it's important not only because of the picture it represents, but it's important because of its purpose. We find that the purpose of the triumphal entry really was for Jesus at this point in his ministry to deliver himself as the lamb to be slain. We know throughout Jesus' ministry, early ministry, there, there frequently we hear uh, it was not his time. Don't tell anybody it's not his time. And when they came to get him, he would pass through their midst. Why? It wasn't his time. Well, now it's his time. And he comes to Jerusalem. You see, his disciples thought that since he had power over death, I mean, after all, in his ministry, he had raised a, a boy, he had raised a girl, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And his disciples were just a, a, of the opinion that Jesus could not, would not die. But Jesus had come, in fact, to die. And he would not give up the purpose for which he came simply because he was acclaimed and welcomed in Jerusalem. He did not come the first time for acceptance and popularity. He came to reconcile the enemies of God to the Father. And this could only be accomplished through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ to satisfy God's justice for the sin of mankind and to change the sinner into a saint. Jesus himself said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Again, Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and what? To give his life a ransom for many. He came not for a kingly crown, but for a crown of thorns. Not to conquer and overcome Roman oppression, but to conquer and overthrow sin and death. He came to bring peace to troubled hearts, he came to give joy to lives overwhelmed with sorrow and defeat. He came to give us life and life more abundant and to fill us with a satisfying contentment more than anything the world could offer. His disciples wrongly thought he was coming to take his position as king. And so did the throngs that followed him into Jerusalem that day. Even the enemies of Christ were wrong about his coming. It's interesting, the enemies really did not try to stop him. Oh, yes, in Luke chapter 19, we find the Pharisees. What did the Pharisees say? The Pharisees said uh, in this account, uh, some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. You know, I, I read that and I thought, why are they calling him master and then telling him to do something? You don't tell the master what to do. The master does what he's going to do. We have to follow. But they said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And what did Jesus say? I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And so there were some in the crowd that probably didn't appreciate what was happening. And, and the enemies of Jesus, they, they saw his popularity. And, and, and perhaps their thinking was, if this man really does have such power, and, and we're unable to kill him, and he truly does impose his kingdom upon us, what's going to happen to us if we resist? We'll just keep quiet for now. We'll just go along to get along, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll shout Hosanna to, just to let them know that we're really not against him. But, of course, we knew they were. They kept silence until they realized that Jesus on his own was not going to use his popularity, this opportunity to overthrow their rule. The procession ended as quickly and as voluntarily as it started. He could have ruled had he chosen to. But he came the first time not to rule, but to save. And so the importance of this triumphal entry is seen in the picture that it represents about what is going to happen when he comes triumphantly again. The purpose was to present himself not as the king, but as the one who would die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And what about the prophecy that it fulfills? Number three, 500 years before the triumphal entry, the prophet Zechariah wrote of this very thing. Zechariah 9.9, 9, if you'd like to take the time to find Zechariah. But here's the prophecy. 
Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Just as Zechariah prophesied, Jesus came into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Jesus, of course, knew what was prophesied about him. And he fulfilled every prophecy exactly in spite of the hatred of those who opposed him. Oh, there were many followers of Christ that day as they welcomed him to Jerusalem, but there are many enemies as well. So too when Jesus Christ comes again and, and, and he entered at the back of a donkey. Justice was prophesied deliberately in full command and in absolute triumph into an atmosphere that appeared to be for him, but under the current, the leaders of the religious crowd were devising ways to get rid of him. The very people who shouted Hosanna would soon be crying out for his death. But this was all part of his plan. Jesus had everything under control. He had come to die. Palm Sunday was the beginning of the end. And in a few short days, he would be betrayed, arrested, tried, found guilty, and crucified. Prophecy becomes reality. And of course, his enemies thought they had won. They were simply, unknowingly really, part of God's eternal plan. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was necessary to provide salvation to a world of dying men. The cross is the way to God. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In 1 Peter 1, 19, we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spots. This is why he came, to present himself as the Lamb of God. The triumphal entry of Christ is indeed an important event in the life of our Lord. And the lessons we can learn from it. But there's an interesting participant, secondly, this morning. Verse 2. Jesus says to his disciples as they're coming, getting ready to go into Jerusalem, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you be entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if a man say unto you, Why do ye this? Ye say that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto him, What do ye, loosing the colt? You know, I bet the disciples thought, that's exactly what Jesus said they were going to say. How does he know that? We know how he knows that. Verse 6, And they said unto him, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and cast their garments on him, and he sat upon him. Now there's another uh, I think it's John's gospel that talks about uh, the, the foal, the, the, the baby, the, the, the firstborn. There, there was a colt, there was a, there was a donkey, and then it was the donkey's child. What do you, how do you say that? The donkey's donkey. Um, the, the mom and the baby, okay? And, and it's the baby that, 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 Je, that Jesus rode on, okay? And the colt, uh, the young one, uh, the firstborn uh, of this colt uh, is what Jesus rode on. So what's so interesting about this participant? Why an animal like a donkey? Why not a stately uh, white horse with all of its regalia of a conquering king? Uh, why not perhaps a, even a, a stately well-decorated camel? I mean, after all, he'd be much higher and people could really see him and, and pay homage to him. Oh, there may be several reasons why, but I think one is certainly because his kingdom was not of this world. He was not interested in the world's fanfare. But there's another interesting thought that I'd like to look at this morning and make some application. Would you turn to Exodus chapter 34? What does Exodus 34 have to do with the triumphal entry and this interesting participant of a colt, a young donkey? Exodus 34 is a recording of the second tables of the law. Remember the first tables were destroyed when Moses, uh, Joshua came down from the mount. And so we just have a record now of the second giving. And, and it's a lot of repeat from earlier in Exodus. But uh, beginning at verse 19, 
All that openeth the matrix is mine, every firstling among the cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. In other words, the firstborn belongs to God, and the firstborn uh, is offered to God through a sacrifice. Not the firstborn being sacrificed, but a lamb is sacrificed, uh, saying that that firstborn animal or human belongs to God, is, is the idea here. But the first, play, but notice verse 20, but the firstling of an ass, a donkey, thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem, firstborn of thy sons, and none shall before, appear before me empty. Now, firstborn donkey is born. If you don't redeem him with the sacrifice of a lamb, what are you supposed to do? Break his neck. Why? Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I, I, I read probably five different commentaries, went online and looked at several commentaries, and they all skip right over that verse. No one would tell me why they broke the donkey's neck if it wasn't sacrificed. So let's make some application, all right? Again, the firstborn son of a man had to be redeemed. The firstborn foal or colt of a donkey, in both cases, a lamb had to be slain. It's important to note. In the case of the colt, if the owner was not prepared to redeem the creature, it had to break its neck. And of course, breaking the neck of a colt, the colt would die. Now, we know that there is a wonderful object lesson here, that the stated law, the law as given in the Old Testament, symbolizes man in all of his need of one who can redeem him and harness his wayward spirit. You see, the law was given to show us that we couldn't save ourselves. The law was given to, to know that we cannot, that we need a redeemer. We needed one who could fulfill the law perfectly, and his name was Jesus Christ. And so the law was given to show us our need of a Savior, to show us how we could be released and redeemed from our sin. Now that sounds familiar when it comes to this matter of this interesting participant, because this cult, first of all, needed to be redeemed. This cult needed to be redeemed by the sacrifice of a lamb, a perfect sacrifice without blemish. A lamb had to have its blood shed for the redemption to take place. Without that sacrifice, the creature would die. His neck would be broken. No hope, no life. If that colt were to live, a sacrifice had to be offered. Now, please understand, I'm not talking about the redemption of a colt, spiritually speaking. That colt didn't get saved. Okay? The colt was simply given to God by the sacrifice of the people who sacrificed for that cult. And so it was offered to God, whatever that means in that time, it was to, this cult belongs to God to be used for God's service or however that worked. But it was an opportunity for people to recognize this was given to me from God and I'm going to give a sacrifice to let God know that this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. And the cult, without that sacrifice of the lamb, would die. He needed to be redeemed. But back to Mark chapter 11, we find something else about this cult. In Mark chapter 11, we find another word that I think is very important for our study this morning here. And, and Jesus said, as soon as ye be, this is verse 2, as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat, loose him, and bring him. And when they were loosing him, verse 4, men want to know why. And they told him what Jesus said, and they let them go. When they loosed him, that is the idea of being released. This donkey had to be redeemed and had to be released. The colt had been tied up. The colt had been bound. The colt had been fettered. There was no freedom of movement for this colt. But when Jesus requested that the colt be released from that which bound him, the colt was given liberty. The colt was given freedom from its owner so that the Lord might use him. Now there's great application for us, and I probably don't even need to mention it because you understand. Just as that colt was loosed, just as that colt was released from its bondage, so too, when you are redeemed, my friend, the Lord Jesus releases you from the bondage of sin. 
If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Romans 8, 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus Christ hath made us free from the law of sin and death. When you and I are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, we have liberty from the, sa from the slavery of sin and the condemning power of the law. And what a release that is. No more to wonder if our good works are enough. No more to worry if my baptism or my church attendance is all I need to get to heaven. No more do I need to doubt and, and question my eternal life in Christ. When we are truly redeemed by the Spirit of God, we are released from the fear and the anxiety and the worry and the doubts about where we will spend eternity. We can know it absolutely for sure because we've been redeemed and released from the bonds of sin. If God has redeemed you, he has released you from your works and your worry. <laughs> you have absolute and can have absolute confidence that his work on the cross and your acceptance of its truth is sufficient for your salvation. Have you been redeemed this morning? Do you know Christ is your personal savior? If so, you've been released. You're no longer in bondage to sin. You are no longer captive to having to do enough in order to make God happy, in order to please God, in order to gain favor with God. You are already accepted in the beloved. Thank God for that. Can you imagine living a life thinking, boy, I hope I did enough for God today. I hope God's happy with me today. You're already accepted in the beloved. Amen. You are saved. You're released from those doubting, nagging, frustrating thoughts. Oh, have I done enough for Jesus? Now, there is a sense in which we understand that serving God is a, a wonderful privilege and, and, and we can never do enough. But it's not a matter of doing enough for our salvation. It's not a matter of doing enough so that I can do this or that. No, we, we've been released. We are saved for sure. We've been released from those bonds of sin. And thank God, that's what takes place when we get saved. Well, let me close this morning by giving one more thought about this interesting participant, this donkey. Notice verse 7. They brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him and he sat upon him. Now, you've probably heard this before, but we found in verse number two that nobody had ever sat on this donkey before. I don't know about you, but have you ever seen a donkey that doesn't want to be ridden? You ever seen a donkey that doesn't want to go anywhere? They always show people dragging this donkey along and the donkey just putting his feet in and, and they put the, 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 the proverbial stick with a, a piece of carrot out in front and the donkey just keeps following that carrot. You got to wonder what that donkey's thinking. How come I can't catch up to that carrot? I keep walking and it's still in front of me. Maybe if I go faster. No, it goes fast. The donkeys either aren't too brilliant or they just understand that there's a carrot out there and I'll get there eventually. But donkeys are very stubborn animals. An unbroken colt is even more wild. And yet... In front of this cheering, shouting crowd, Jesus gives evidence of his deity and his total mastery over the world of nature when he sits on an unbroken colt, willingly. And that colt didn't buck, didn't try to throw him off. That colt understood who was sitting on his back. This is the creator of the world. This is God incarnate. And I used to have an owner up the hill there, but I got loose, and now I have a new, new owner, and his name is Jesus. Now, the donkey's not thinking this, but let's, let's put ourselves in that donkey's place. That's where we are. When we are on the other side in our sin, we were serving ourselves. We were our own master. But when we got redeemed and released, guess what? We have now a new owner. We have a new master to rule our lives. We've been redeemed by God's grace. We've been released uh, from the power and control of sin. And now we have a new master, one who to rule over us. You see, sin once ruled, now Jesus Christ reigns. Self once reigned, now Jesus Christ rules. Romans 6, 14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you. It shall not rule. As a born-again Christian, 
You have a new master, a new Lord, a new king. And this donkey teaches us a lesson. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 11, we are to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You've been redeemed if you're a born-again Christian. You've been released from the doubts and the fears and the shackles of sin. Thank God for that. How about the rulership of Christ in your life? Does he rule today? Or are you still like that unbroken colt, bucking the will of God? Trying to get him off your back, so to speak. Are you hesitant to humbly and submissively bow to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ in your life? Does he indeed have rule over your life, every part of your life? Is he the Lord of your life. The fact of the matter is, He is Lord. He is King. We just need to recognize Him that in our life. Amen. He already is. We just need to recognize that every day that we live, that He is the Lord. He is the King. We owe Him our loyal allegiance. We owe Him our complete obedience. We, we can do no less for all that He has done for us. Well, we can learn some lessons from the triumphal entry, and we can even learn lessons from a donkey. May God help us to do so as we rejoice in this particular day, what Christ did in presenting himself, not as the king to rule over the nations, but as the savior to go to the cross for the sins of the whole world. So bow your heads with me in prayer this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the lessons we can learn from the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for this narrative found in all four Gospels to show us the importance of why Jesus came into the city on that particular day and in that particular manner. Nothing is by accident. Lord, all of this was planned, and you fulfilled the plan perfectly for your purpose. Lord, I pray you'll help us here this morning to consider our own lives and, and, and to, first of all, rejoice that you are the Savior, but then to ask ourselves the question, am I a born-again Christian? Do I know Christ as my personal Savior? You might believe that he is the Savior, and you might believe in the, all the Easter story things, but, but have you personally repented of your sin and asked Jesus Christ to save you? Do you know for sure you're on your way to heaven this morning? Father, if there are some here that don't have that assurance, I pray that you'll speak to their hearts. Holy Spirit, do a work in their life that only you can do. And perhaps there's others here, Lord, that need that wonderful assurance that they are indeed children of God as they live for you and walk according to your will. And may they accept your kingship, your rulership over their lives. There are some who are like that stubborn donkey, just digging in their heels and not willing to follow completely the will of God for their life. Lord, I pray, speak to hearts here this morning. Whatever the need is, may decisions be made. Holy Spirit, work in lives and hearts here this morning. With your heads out, still bowed and your eyes closed, let me just ask a couple of questions so I know how I complete my prayer this morning. How many of you say, Pastor, I, I'll be honest. I, I know about God, and I know about what Jesus did on the cross, but I, I can't remember a time in my life when I bowed my head and prayed and asked Jesus to save me and to take away my sins. I don't remember repenting. I can't point to a time. I, I just think I've been a Christian all my life. But I can't remember a time when I, with my mouth and my heart, accepted the truth of salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ. You say, I, I'm concerned about where I'm going to spend eternity. I don't know for sure, but here's my hand. I want to know for sure. Is there anybody like that this morning? Put your hand up so I can pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. Does it, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. You say, I need to know for sure that I'm a child of God. Here's my hand. Pray for me, Pastor. <coughs> I will assume that if you didn't raise your hand, that you're a born-again Christian here this morning, and that's a blessing to know. It's great to be redeemed, released. Uh, what about this idea of being ruled? 
Are there things in your life that nobody else knows about, but you do? Things that you're just not willing to give up? Things that you kind of enjoy and you know that they don't honor the Lord? And you're not being ruled in the way God would have your life ruled by him, by this master. And you say, Pastor, there's some, there's some things in my life that uh, I've been struggling with, and by God's grace, I, I, I want to overcome with his help. Here's my hand. Would you pray for me this morning? Anybody like that, Christian? Hand right up, right back down. How can I pray for you this morning? Anybody like that? Father, we thank you for each one that's here. We pray, Lord, during this invitation time that folks will come for whatever reason they need to come. Holy Spirit, you do the work. Maybe it's for membership. Perhaps there are some saved that not yet been baptized. Uh, perhaps it's to be saved. They've not yet got that matter settled. Whatever the need is, I pray that you'll help folks to come this morning. Make that decision in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? In your songbooks, page 361, I'd like to say, sing a, a verse, maybe two, of this wonderful hymn, Whiter Than Snow, 361. If you're here this morning and you're not yet a born-again Christian, even though you didn't raise your hand, you still have some questions about your eternal destiny, I'd, I'd invite you to come. Let someone take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're being saved or you are saved. Perhaps you're saved but not yet been baptized by immersion. That, you need to take care of that. It's first mark of obedience and membership in this church. We'd, we'd love to talk to you about that if, if that's uh, your need this morning. But uh, whatever the Spirit of God speaks to you about, you don't uh, be the last one. Be the first one down the aisle and you come and make that decision this morning as we sing. Lord Jesus, whiter than snow. Sing please. Lord Jesus, I long to be Just sing the chorus one more time, please. Sing that chorus. Whiter than snow. Won't you come? Oh, won't you come? Let's put the books away. We'll let the instruments just play through another verse and chorus. This, this verse is for you. Church membership, baptism, salvation. What, what would God have you do? Christian. Surrender. Surrender to his leadership, his kingship in your life. What would God have you do in these few moments? Won't you come? Our Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for this narrative found in all four Gospels of this exciting day of Christ entering Jerusalem. And yet, Lord, uh, we understand uh, the rest of the Gospel accounts reveal the purpose of your coming into the city. And uh, Lord, it's the beginning of the end for your ministry on earth. Uh, Lord, I pray that uh, you'll help us to recall these things. Help us to learn some lessons from that, that donkey that was used. Lord, what a blessing to know that we have been redeemed, released. And Lord, help us to live under your rule in a way that truly honors and glorifies you. Thank you again for this time together this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. Let me just make a couple of quick announcements, if I may. Um, if you're visiting, thank you for coming. Stop by our Welcome Center to pick up a, a, a welcome or a visitor gift, a first-time gift. We're glad that you're here. I see some folks who perhaps have been here in the past, but you're back, and we're glad for each one of you. Uh, tonight, I'm making an executive decision. We're not going to have church. I thought I'd get a little bit of, oh. 
but everybody's just smiling at me. Everybody's just smiling. Come on now. It's one of those things where they say we're supposed to get six to eight, 12, and, and the wind's supposed to pick up. And, and, and we know, we're, we're all used to weather forecasts around here. We might get two. But in case we get six or eight, I, I don't want to make it a conflict. Do I go, do I not go? So don't. Uh, now, if you want to come to church tonight, that's fine. Just sit in the parking lot, watch the plows. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it's a better part of judgment with the system that they say is coming. And it's looking pretty realistic as I look at the radar earlier today. Uh, that it could. So I, I think it'd just be best to be safe, uh, to stay inside, and uh, let me encourage you to do something. My message tonight was going to be on the three temple visits. What did Jesus do after he came into the city? Well, the first visit, he went into the temple and he just looked around, and then he went home. The next day, he went into the temple and uh, he cleared the place out of the money changers, day two. Day three, he went in and he was accosted, and I'll say it that way, he was captured by three different groups of people, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the, um, what's another group that was there in that town? I can't remember, uh, Herodians and Pharisees and some others. But they all asked him questions, trying to trip him up. So let me just encourage you this evening, get your family together, and read the rest of chapter 11, read 12, read 13, uh, and uh, just kind of give you an idea of what Jesus went through that, that last week even before his trial and so on. Um, or another good idea is uh, most of our messages are um, uh, archived. So maybe you can go back and watch one that you disagreed with to see if you still disagree <laughs> or that uh, maybe you want to, oh man, I need, I need that one again. Uh, but they're all on there. So, the so anyways, uh, listen to Pastor Mark from a couple weeks ago. That was fabulous. So uh, take some time, uh, the wonders of technology. Um, I, I don't think we'll be... We won't be here to live stream anything um, unless I can get my FaceTime on my phone working. I'm not going to worry about that. So uh, anyways, just be aware of nothing. Now, tomorrow night, men's, uh, men's Bible study perhaps will take place depending on, again, travel situations. Uh, your leaders on Monday night will let you know that guys that come, whether you will or not. Same with the Tuesday morning Bible study. Again, the system could wrap up. It might not. So uh, just be aware. Keep your ears open. Uh, Wednesday, things calm down and settle down, and hopefully roads will be clear, and we'll have a wonderful time in the house of God on Wednesday. So uh, looking forward to that. Of course, there's no school Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It's an Easter break for them. And then uh, next Sunday, as you can see in the bulletin, we'll have a, uh, a breakfast downstairs in the kitchen, in the cafeteria, in the gym, excuse me. Uh, and uh, so you come at the 930 hour and enjoy fellowship and some breakfast, and then you'll be in your place for our Easter service here in the auditorium next Sunday and no Sunday evening service on Easter Sunday. As a pastor, taking two Sunday nights off is scary. Thank you for filling in the blank. Because people get used to it. I'll just stay home and watch them on TV. Um, so two Sunday nights in a row, but that's okay. It'll just make you anxious to be back the following, right? Amen. Good, good, good preaching, preacher. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here this morning. Welcome one another. Thank you so much for coming. Have a safe trip on your way home. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you. We are dismissed.